welcome, Stacey. Thanks, Lee. You've Excited been to us. be here. <laughs> How could you not be? <laughs> You've been with us before. You've been on some of our panels. This is your first time on the main stage and um, your first time here in this new role. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I want to, since, since you are new to our, our community, I thought I would start with your background. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about yourself. You are one of six children. You call yourself the well-adjusted middle child. Yes. <laughs> um, knowing you briefly, I, would, I can vouch that I think that's the case. Um, and you started at the New York Stock Exchange as a college intern when you were an engineering major in, at Lehigh. So, um, and you fell in love with the trading floor. So tell us what that was like and why you fell in love with the trading floor. You know, I mean, you walk onto that trading floor and there's just no place like it. I mean, you could feel the energy. You can feel how the, the pace is so, is so quick. And I had no idea that I would be interested in the financial markets. I, I always liked math and science, so I thought engineering just made sense for me, and I did in, enjoy those, the studying that. But I enjoyed it, and I thought I was pretty good at it. When I got onto the trading floor, I loved it. And that was different. You know, you, you, you feel that passion right away. And so I knew that's what I wanted to do with, with my career. So I went back to school, and I finished my degree in engineering. But as soon as I was done, I went back to work on the, on the trading floor. And your dad was a trader on the New York Stock Exchange. He wasn't on the trading floor. My dad was a, uh, an equity trader, an institutional block trader. So he worked in an office and was, was upstairs on, on a desk. But he uh, was in the business. So when I was trying to get a summer job, he had said, well, maybe, maybe I know somebody that can, can help you. And, and you know, I firmly believe if you can get an opportunity where somebody can open a door for you, there's nothing wrong with taking it. You need to earn your right to stay in the room. And so I, I, I focused on, on that. But so he had, he had uh, connected me with the New York Stock Exchange, and, and I started on the trading floor. But when you were really little, you actually thought he was a sock trader. Yeah, I had no idea what he did. And so <laughs> when my mom would say, oh, he trades stocks, I was like, he trades socks? That's so weird. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it's because they were mismatched or something? And, and I had pi pi pictures of him, you know, in my head, uh, you know, tr trading blue socks for black socks or something like that. So funny. So, and when you returned and you became a floor clerk and then a specialist, you were one of 30 or so women among 1,300 men. Um, what was that like? I, you know, I loved it. I loved being on the floor. As a woman on the trading floor, you had a much higher profile than, than men. So I think, you know, this cuts both ways when, when you're outnumbered. And for me, it, it worked well. I, you know, like you said, Lee, I was one of six kids. I came up, grew up in a household where you had to talk over each other to get heard. And so that worked on a trading floor and it felt very, <laughs> felt very at home and I, it wasn't uncomfortable for me at all. Uh, in hindsight, as I, over the past year where there's been so much dialogue around women in the different work environments and how they may be treated, I probably did tune out a lot of noise. You know, if, if I self-reflect, there probably were things that I just ignored because I, I felt like they were less relevant to to me each day, but, but I'm, you I'm never sure there was You never consciously noise. suffered any injustices or any bad instances or felt, um, you know, marginalized. Yeah, I, I, I drew very specific boundaries on the trading floor. I was very clear what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. And I usually said it with a smile. You know, I would look at somebody and say, you yeah, have too far. And they would, they would laugh and say, sorry. And they never really went back there again. And I think part of that was kind of finding our balance. And those boundaries, I think, don't necessarily apply for everybody and for every interaction. You know, so with certain people that I worked with, the boundaries might be a little bit different than others. And I, you know, I think that's OK. It's not a one size fits all. Uh, you know, so you, and, you know, it would take a little time to navigate that. But uh, you know, it worked for me. And then you took a break. You left the New York Stock Exchange, Exchange and you went to cooking school, but not because you had any interest in becoming a chef at all. You just wanted to do it for fun. I, I like to eat. So that was a, a big focus for me. And, and you know, when you worked on the trading floor, you sometimes would say, well, what would I do? Because it's such a unique environment. You would think, well, what would I do if I didn't do this? And there were times where I thought, well, I'd go to culinary school, but I didn't want to start in that industry at 30 years old. So I ended up going for fun because I figured I'm always going to eat. And if I can eat better food, that would just be fun. And, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted my next step to be when I left the floor. So it bought me some time to think about it and breathe a little bit and decide where I wanted to go next. Um, then you came back and you worked at the New York Stock Exchange for a few years and ultimately, obviously, you were C COO. And I actually went to NASDAQ went when to, I left. Sorry, yeah, went to NASDAQ. So I went to the dark side, as my colleagues on the trading floor would say. It's like, how could you go to, to work for NASDAQ? And when I worked on the trading floor, it's important to note I didn't work for the New York Stock Exchange. I was a, a market maker. So I was a specialist and I, I traded the securities that were listed on the exchange. So I worked for a trading firm. But still, that community is, how could you go to NASDAQ? You know, but at, at that time, you know, when I just made the decision to leave the trading floor, 
The New York Stock Exchange was the incumbent. We were the largest exchange, and it was in large part because we were there longer. So when you're there for 200 years and everyone's doing business with you, you many people were choosing to do business with us because we were the biggest. And that wasn't satisfying for me. I wanted our clients to do business with us because we were the best. And it, there, it didn't seem at that point in time that there was a real drive to, to make that, that shift. Uh, and so I left, and, and I, I joined uh, another exchange, again, through communication with somebody I used to know who said, hey, we're building a team. Could you, can you come help us here? So, so I went there for a few years. And um, NASDAQ, by the way, is run by Adina Friedman, the CEO of NASDAQ. And you used to work with Adina, and you know her. So now you're both really competing against each other for listings. I mean, what's that like? Yeah, you know, I, I think the relationship between NASDAQ and New York is, is, uh, is interesting because we share a lot of the same perspectives on what's good for corporate America, what's good for the markets here in the US, and, and we have very similar positions on a lot of issues, and, and so we're aligned in, in, in many ways. We fiercely compete <laughs> in, in other in But other I ran places. into you at a party last week, and you were standing there talking. You're also friends. Y yeah, we're, we have a very cordial relationship, and you know, it's great to- That's to how women compete. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I just want to touch on a couple. So, you know, trading is going through some challenges right now. So, um, the, 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 you know, the rise of electronic trading has dramatically changed the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, there are more rivals now. Um, the New York Stock Exchange accounts for a fewer percent of the overall trades than it did 10 years ago. And then we have this issue where companies are saying privates for so long, they're not going public um, as often as they used to. So how are you addressing you know, these challenges? Well, I think, I think you touch on a couple different things there. One is the competitive landscape. And so it was really exciting for me to come back and lead an organization that I had such passion for because I grew up there. I mean, I literally grew up on the trading floor. You know, I became an adult and I thought about the real world. And so to be able to come back and say, now you're going to lead this organization as we reinvent ourselves. And it was before I took the, the role of president, even as chief operating officer and other roles, we were really redefining how we thought about that business so that people were choosing to do business with us because they wanted to and not because we were so big. The landscape is more fragmented. So back when I was working on the trading floor, 85% of trading happened on the floor. But due to a number of regulatory uh, shifts, now that you know, trade almost 40% of overall US trading happens off of exchanges and in what are broker-dealer um, venues. So that, that's a real shift in competing for that piece of piece of the pie. I, I think also when you look at the, the public company, the numbers of public companies fell by half over a 20 year period. That's not a good thing because when a company goes public, they're av available to all investors to take benefit of that growth and that access to that, to that growth. And if you wait for a company to become a really big company, then most of that growth has already happened. So the everyday investor misses out on that. And because of today's world, there's a lot of access to private capital, and there are a lot of challenges in the public markets, things that you guys are dealing with all the time, whether it's the complying with regulations or uh, addressing how you may interact with proxy advisory firms or how your shareholder disclosure, uh, what visibility you have into your shareholders. All, all of those things are, are, you know, create some challenges for public companies. We talk a little bit less around the benefits of being a couple public company, but I want to make sure that the, that balance is right, that we are achieving the right balance, so that people are coming to the public markets and not leaving the everyday investor out of it. We're going to open it up for questions if anybody has questions in just a minute. But um, tell us about when you were named president. I mean, obviously, as Nina mentioned in her introduction, this is a very weighty role. This is a role with incredibly rich history. It's very important. Um, you are the first woman to hold the role. But you have said that wasn't significant to you. What was significant to you was that you were becoming the president of the New York Stock Exchange. So you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's an institution, and it was a very important part of my life and part of, of my background. So leading that organization was very humbling for me and, and important. I was proud. I'm proud of the team there. I'm proud of what we accomplished, and I'm proud of what we do. And you know, slight aside, Wall Street often gets a, a pretty bum rap because it feels like hey, it's just about the rich getting richer. When I look at what our core mission is at the New York Stock Exchange, it's to help companies raise money so that they, they can go out and change the world and to provide investors with opportunities to take part in that growth. That's a good thing. You know, we look at what those companies achieve that are listed with us, and they literally are changing the world every day. They do it in different ways. You know, back in the early days, it was more traditional businesses. Those businesses are evolving themselves too. So I'm very proud of what we do there, and I, and I think it's something that the whole industry should should be proud of. And you know, that's that's certainly a, a humbling. 
the media attention around being a woman was surprising. I, I just didn't, I maybe shouldn't have been surprised, but I was. I, I thought it would be a line in the story, and I didn't expect it to be so much of the story. The story, yeah. yeah. It was powerful, though, to hear how many women uh, and, and men and women thought their daughters would benefit from seeing women in senior roles. And so I do think it's important for all of us and everybody in this room to be out there and be present so others know that they can follow in, in footsteps and you know, blaze whatever path makes sense for them. What does your dad think? Uh, you know, my dad is, is a stereotypical Irish guy, so he's uh, not, not a man of many words, but you could see in, in, in his face he's very proud and, and it, a couple tears maybe along the way. Mm -hmm. Love it. Aww. Who has a question for Stacy? Anyone? I certainly have more. Oh, one back there. Okay. So following up on your last comment, what do you think are the one or two things that could be done to, to flip that trend of public and private companies? Yeah, one, one of the things that, that we focus on is the uh, requirements and some of the, the rules that are out there, right? And so uh, we even just saw recently, should companies change their reporting cycle, right? So we don't necessarily think that it's better to report less frequently because the investors need to be protected at the same time. So we're trying to get that balance for companies to provide enough information so that investors are protected, but be able to lead their businesses on a long-term time frame. So you know, that's one, one issue. When we look at the challenges around, um, uh, you know, if you look at some of the companies that are choosing to stay private, they're waiting until they can build out an infrastructure that can address some of the regulations that exist in, uh, in Dodd-Frank or you know, the Sarbanes-Oxley provision. So right-sizing those things so they're not waiting to, the, to have a whole department that can handle those things is, is a benefit, and that's something that we, we focus on and spend a lot of time in DC on. Over there. Yeah. Um, if you had the opportunity, the opportunity to go back to the past with the expertise that you have now, what would have you done differently, in a different way? I may have been a little less hesitant to try new things early on. I was focused on making sure I could be successful before I ever tried anything new. You know, so you wanted to know that you had the, all the skills you needed to try the next thing, and you don't need to do that. You, you can go try something new, and maybe it doesn't all work out perfectly, but you're, you're gonna figure it out. And, more often than not, it isn't going to be an issue for you to, to get into a, a space that you didn't operate in before. And, and I think that's really important because your skills prepare you for the next challenge, not the job you had before. You know, it, it's, it's how you think, how you operate, how you problem solve. That's really what gets you ready for the next bit. Nobody ever did a job before they had that job. So we should stop thinking that you have to do that. Uh, lastly, we're just about out of time, but what's the biggest piece of advice you got going into this job that really helped you? And what's the biggest way your life has changed in this job? I would say that the biggest piece of advice I got that was most impactful for me was not necessarily with this job, but when I took one prior and uh, my boss, Tom Farley at the time said to me, hey, you like to have 90% of information before you make a decision. And you really need to just pull the trigger at 70. You know, just get close, figure it out, and don't spend a whole lot of time getting to the perfect answer. You'll address it and you move on. I totally changed the way I operated after that advice. I went back a year later and said, hey, Tom, really, thanks for that advice. It really was impactful and it, it changed how I operated. He said, that wasn't me, that was Colin Powell. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was, uh, I was like, oh, he's like, he's got a whole rule of 40, 70. And, and since I took this job, I've had the opportunity to meet with Colin Powell a couple of times and I told him that, uh, you know, he impacted my career without knowing it. <laughs> That's great advice. And what about just the way, you're, how, how has your life changed? I mean, so many more demands on your time. I, I have to be more conscious of how I spend my time because a lot of it can just get sucked up. Yeah, I think that applies to, to everybody in this room, no doubt. Um, Stacy, thank you so much for being thank here. Congratulations. Please join me in thanking Stacy. Thank you.